Now coming to tonight's session, I'm very excited and happy to welcome Mr. Sai Satish Vedam, the moderator of this session. Mr. Vedam is the Chief Product Officer, Senior Faculty and an Executive Coach at the Institute of Product Leadership. He was most recently the Senior Director of Product Management at Oracle. Great to have you here, Mr. Vedam. Handing the session over to you now. Thank you, Shama. And uh, good evening, all of you folks. If you're joining us on day two, we had an exciting session yesterday, day one. And uh, today's sessions are promising to be equally exciting, interesting, and insightful. So I see several folks joining uh, on Zoom. And um, as Shema was mentioning, this is also streamed live on LinkedIn, um, as well as other channels, YouTube and Twitter. So uh, you know, to get started, it gives me great pleasure to uh, introduce to all of you, Mr. Indy Chakraborty. Um, Indy, if you are here, can you turn on the video and say hello so that we know the video is working and audio is working and I'll, I'll get started with your introduction. Yeah, absolutely. You can hear me fine. Absolutely. Great. Um, thanks for joining, Indy. And uh, for the folks here, a uh, quick brief about uh, Indy Chakraborty. He's the Chief Strategy and Marketing Officer at Aveta. Um, Aveta is actually a SaaS product company in the space of supply chain management, serving industries like oil and gas and telecommunications and others. Now, India has played leadership roles and has over 20 plus years experience in product strategy, corporate marketing and product management. So what, a, what, a, what an eclectic mix that you have in the here. And I'm sure um, there's pretty interesting journey and learnings. If there are any nuggets that you can share with us along the way, it'd be great. So the topic today, of course, uh, India is going to speak to us about is, um, at least the way I'm understanding right now, before we get into it is, Strategic vision is very important, but then most of us don't understand how that plays out in a day-to-day -day life, right? How does it get um, translated into action? So let's hear it uh, from Indy on that particular topic. Hopefully it'll bring us uh, some practical insights and examples that he can share with all of us. Uh, thank you, Indy, and uh, welcome. So just before we get started, a uh, couple of things, right? One. I encourage all of you on, in the audience to ask your questions in the Q&A chat, Q&A window, not the chat, because there's a lot of chatter in the chat, so it might get lost. So please ask your question in Q&A if you're on Zoom. If you're on LinkedIn, ask your question in the, in the thread. Uh, the team is actually collating that, and, and we will address those, and I, know I will bring those questions to Indy um, after his session. Right, so before we get started, Indy, I thought it will be good for us to understand uh, who our audience is a little bit, right? So who is joining, where are they joining, and their level of understanding or exposure to strategic activities, right? So let me uh, start off with a few polls, three quick polls. Uh, hopefully that gives us uh, a good insight into who the audience is, and then you can, you know, probably highlight some different aspects or de-emphasize on certain things accordingly, right? So Shama, if we can launch that poll, uh, the first one uh, is about the organization. Which organization are you in right now? How do you describe that, right? So um, go through that a little bit. I strongly request and even encourage um, all of you on the call today to take that poll, um, which will help us really understand uh, your your motivations to be here, your background, so that we can make this better for you. So each of the poll, I think we can probably give about 20 seconds or so, um, and then we can get started. Really. Good, interesting. So we see, you know, again, unsurprising, uh, most of the folks seems to be working in IT services companies, uh, which is where you know, a lot of Indian IT ecosystem is today slowly graduating towards uh, products. Thank you, Shama. We could uh, bring up the next poll. Um, and then let's see if, so I see only few of you are voting. I strongly encourage uh, if you do it. So this helps us understand again, you know, uh, the question is clear, right? I'm sure many of you have moved to your hometowns due to pandemic. Uh, I know I've been talking to a lot of folks and uh, that's what they did. But before pandemic, where were you? Which city do you actually work, right? So 
Um, 40, 42% in Bangalore, um, again, not at all a surprise. Um, and again, thank you all for joining from outside. I see interesting couple of folks from outside India. Um, welcome. Uh, let's move on to the third one. This one is more about um, what is the level of understanding and also in their roles, right? So depending on which education background they come from um, and, and the companies that they are working in and the type of role that they are working in, right? So I see uh, there's, a, there's a neck to neck between undergraduate and postgraduate, which is good. Uh, very few doctoral uh, folks and uh, good amount of MBA folks. Uh, that's that's good to know. Thank you. And uh, a final one. Um, I hope I'm not taking away the time that you need indeed, but uh, I thought this would uh, help us understand the audience a little better. So let's move to the next one, Shema. Yeah, so this is mostly around what kind of activities do you typically spend time on when it comes to strategic planning, right? So there are many more, but at least uh, if some of them it could be more than one here. Great, a lot of you seem to be active and spending time on roadmaps, strategic roadmaps that is. None in market sizing, which is kind of surprising, I thought uh, that is something that uh, is part of strategic activities. Now again, um, the strategy is a very heavy word. Uh, you know, we can use it to describe anything. It's also um, has that gravitas, if you will. Corporate strategy, business strategy, product strategy, sales, technology, all of them are different, but um, whichever role that you are in that applies to. Okay, super. I think uh, majority we have on the roadmap front, then the next one is build by partner. Awesome. Well, um, hopefully that's useful a little bit uh, to you as well in, in, in the and uh, please take it away. And, and uh, we will take the questions at the end, so we can go through uninterrupted on this. Okay, so I'll share my screen here and uh, we'll get started. So, you know, this idea of strategy, uh, when I kind of first entered it, I definitely felt this heavy weight of strategy is this big deal and you have, you know, somehow this incredible knowledge and insight of what the future looks like. And it's none of that. I mean, looking at what the future looks like is like a fun thing to read in headlines. Strategic work is just tactical in the weeds, working through operations. And that's, that's what I'm going to talk about here. Um, so let me start with this uh, common uh, refrain that you see from management guru, P Peter Drucker. He said, culture eats strategy for breakfast. And what he means by that is the way that your organization works is really what creates great outcomes naturally in the future and not some smart guy who says, you know, this is what the future looks like. Let's all go do that. And, you know, I'll add to that, that operational effectiveness eats culture eating strategy for breakfast. Because what we're really talking about there in terms of culture is the culture of operationally how operationally lean and mean and effective is your organization? And I mean to say that as an inversion of the idea of strategy, which is that the idea of strategy is that it's this far thinking, you sit back, you stare at the clouds and you come up with what the future will look like. And it's just the opposite. You can do that all you want. No one will ever implement that strategy because what is not strategy is the three-year plan. The three-year plan is a wonderful document you have to create because it's needed for marketing, uh, whether it's investors or your own employees. You have to have this thing where you're going to do something that will change the world that in year one will, of course, not do anything, but by year three will have changed the world. You got to create that. It's important. It's, you know, it's not that it's worthless. There, there's a it helps crystallize your own thinking and your organization's thinking, but just don't ever think that the three-year plan has something to do with your strategy because it's not operational. So what's gonna stop you from being strategically effective? And it's your clients. Clients is why you cannot implement strategy. And I'll walk through a little bit of why that is, and then I'll give you a specific case study of how 
we achieve a real strategic goal only through tactical steps. So I'll call this the whiner's curse. You, you've heard of winner's curse maybe, but whiner's curse is the idea that you have a current customer. And yeah, I'm gonna use, I'm basically repurposing an old Henry Ford analogy. So the, your current customer has a horse and carriage and your strategic direction is you're gonna create the model S, not the model T, but the model S, right? That's your strategic direction. So you go talk to your customer and you say, hey customer, what would you like in the future? And what he says is that I want a horse and carriage with two horses. And, and the issue is your customer is asking, pleading, whining maybe for you to deliver on two horses. He's like, when's the second horse coming? When's the second horse coming? And you're like, no, 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 we're building this factory and it's gonna build this you know, metal container with an engine and it'll go by itself, don't worry. He's like, okay, that's great. Where's the second horse, right? So this is the whiner's curse. And I don't, I don't mean it to be insulting at all about customers. They're the lifeblood of an organization. You do have to listen to exactly what they're saying. It's, I'm making the reverse point. I'm not making the point, don't listen to your customers. I'm saying absolutely listen to your customers and strategy has to figure out how to survive within that world. So you have this decision matrix, much like the real matrix. Uh, how many customers do you have? You, you start with this question. Do you have a bunch of customers? And it, and it means two different paths, right? The first path, the red pill, blue pill in the matrix. Do you not have many customers today? Well, then what should you do? You should definitely do what your customer says so you can get customers because you don't have a lot of customers. So if you don't have customers, definitely just make that second horse because you need more customers. So now what happens when you have lots of customers? Well, you have lots of customers, but you definitely do what the customer says because you have to support revenue. You have this all these employees and a plan that you've communicated to the board. You got to make that plan. You can't just not service the demands of your largest or your largest number of customers, you gotta do it. So either path, red pill, blue pill, you could just do what the customer says. So where does that leave your strategic direction on the decision matrix? Nowhere, he's outside of the matrix. You can't get to that plan. So you, how do we break through this gridlock? How do we get through it, right? Well, let me tell you this. You see that guy right there, that guy, he doesn't have a three-year plan. He's stuck in traffic. He has no three-year plan, no grand design of how he's gonna get through it. But being in an auto, you know that you get through the traffic pretty quickly. How does the auto do it? So that's the answer that I'll talk through is strategy means to be like the auto. And, and step one of being like the auto is know the roads. You need to know what the landscape looks like. And that's where this three-year plan part ties into it, which is three-year plan thinking helps you understand what your business is like and what's going on in the world around you. So you know the roads. I mean, this example, I'm, I'm, I live in Houston uh, in the US, but I'm originally from Kolkata. So, you know, I make this analogy here where when you had to get to my uh, mom's house, in order, you couldn't turn down the first turn. You had to go down another street and then you turn back to get to that house because you couldn't turn down the first turn. But that guy in an auto, he knows that that's the way that you get to the house because he knows the roads so well. He knows the landscape so well. No three-year plan, but he knows the roads. So then what's next? Well, for, for, for an organization, knowing the roads means knowing your profit and your expenses and the forecast and all of that data that underlies your business. You need to know that walking in. So what's next? Well, three things that you have to do that autos are also incredibly good at. First is maneuverability. You have to be able to understand in your mind what your landscape looks like and what you're trying to achieve, and then move around back and forth fit those ideas into what you're hearing from your customers, not come up with a plan. And what people always want is, you know, I've got this idea. We all think it's great. If someone would just give $5 million of investment, if I could just get two resources, we could make this happen. That is the number one thing. And I'll tell you, you know, CEOs, I always feel for them in that all day, they go from meeting to meeting 
and there's some smart guy who says, here's all we need to do, this, this, this. You just need to give me two people, six people, 10 people, and I'll get it done. So you, but you can't do it with that heavy lift of let me just get a blank sheet of paper and money and resources and we'll make it happen. You have to do what the auto does. You have to duck into the side lane where there isn't traffic and get it done moving towards your end goal. That means collaborating. You're in those autos, those auto guys are always talking to every other auto guy that's in the street. And same thing, if you want to get something done, it really is about the department heads. Because strategy barely has any resources or any budget. You got to convince the department heads. And that means really in the weeds work of improving their lives to be able to get it done. And then finally, adaptability, right? That auto it has been repurposed for every possible transportation function that exists. I don't happen to have a picture of an auto that is a double decker, but I got to imagine someone's built an auto that is a double decker auto. So adaptability, take your plan and fit it into whatever exists already. So then we're going to talk about this case study, right? So this is, this is the last thing that I wanted to cover with you guys. We we're talking about an organization, SMT, Seismic Microtechnology, that I worked at. Uh, a number of years ago, software company, oil and gas software. They basically help people find where to drill for oil. And it was a good company when I walked into it, a, a small mid-sized company, less than hundred million in revenue, but doing very well with a history of nice growth. And where they were in the world is getting near this peak here, this mountain, they had high market share. They, they were the leaders in their space, great organization. But here's the thing. The problem is they were the high market share of the smaller market mountain, meaning they dominated the smaller customer for oil and gas. The big giants, the Exxons and the Shells, they used a lot more sort of complicated, involved with more IT systems kind of software. Our software was quick and easy to run. And then the other software cost you know, 10x more, a lot more complexity. but were, for that reason, used by the big guys. So how do you take an organization then? So now, now you have a problem. You've got a problem in that the company is successful. That's your problem. They're reaching the height of their market share and they're relatively constrained in that market. You can't just take the quick and easy software and say, oh, we're now going to sell what we sell for $50,000 for $5 million and sell it to Exxon. And Exxon's already got product. And you know, they have distribution from the big guys and they're going to buy from the big guys. It's hard to just say, no, buy from me instead. Oil and gas software of this kind is the lifeblood of those organizations. So they're not just going to switch out the core of what their geoscientists do to find oil every day. So what did we do strategically to make a difference? Okay, so our rickshaw rescue plan, first step, know the roads. And that starts with financials. So when we were there, I worked to model what our three-year plan would look like. What would a three years ahead look like? And I remember the shocking conclusion sitting with my CEO that no matter how you did the math, we were going to peak in volumes. No matter what you did, you're going to peak in the yearly number of units sold because of this problem. We were near the peak of our smaller mountain, right? That's something... It was hard to see because year after year, the company had been growing so well, it just felt like, well, this is just a rocket ship. But it's, it's not a rocket ship. If you're in a certain market segment, you're about to saturate that market segment. So we knew we were going to peak in volumes. So market trends. We knew that the larger per part of our small customers were actually growing fast because this was happening during the new U.S. shale boom. I live in Texas, so the shales were happening all around me. This was 2007, 2008. So it's just starting to happen. And then as far as the how the market thought of us, customers directly would say, oh, you guys are the Toyota and the other guy's the Mercedes. But, you know, that's great. I want the Toyota because the Toyota is the lower cost, very reliable, great product. You know, Mercedes is great too, but on the cost basis, Toyota is just as good for my purposes. So we knew that they thought about us in that manner. And then finally, we knew that the product team was at that moment introducing a new time-saving feature that was sort of like a best line fit solution. You know, in the Excel, you can have all these bubbles and then 
Excel will draw a best line that fits it. We had something similar we were, we were building, but for rock structures beneath the ground. You have to spend a lot of time trying to trace how a particular rock formation is moving to the ground. And we created an automatic way of drawing out a line that helps you see a particular rock formation. So we knew that interesting feature that our customers had been asking for, our customers had been asking for was coming. So there wasn't some strategic plan saying, hey, we're gonna build this new technology, then our customers will use it. Our customers were asking for something we were already building. So our strategy was people think of us as a Toyota and they know that the competition is a Mercedes. So why don't we build the interim product, which is the Lexus. Um, so, you know, Toyota is the lower end product. Mercedes is the higher end product. And Lexus came in the what, 1990 or something to be the product that would inhabit the middle between those two tiers. So we said, let's, not, let's try and make our product the Lexus. So premium tier strategy and, uh, you know, I, I like to quote John Keats, the poet laureate John Keats. Uh, his poem was, sell a new feature as a new product line to larger customers for a much higher price. I, I don't think John Keats ever said that. So I, I said that. But it's, it's an important point, right? Take a feature and turn it into a product line selling to the larger customers. So, so let's talk about that. How is that like the auto? We knew the roads, maneuverability. We knew our existing customers wanted this feature X. And what we said is absolutely, we're building that feature X. Why don't we turn it into product line X? Something much larger and expansive than how we envisioned a little feature that was going to add, you know, a little 2%, 5% to our purchase price. Let's see if we can't turn this whole thing into a product, turn it into a Lexus. Okay, so step two, the collaboration. So that part of it, we had to work intensely for weeks with sales, marketing, product, all aligned together, trying to figure this out. Like when you hear this story at the end, it sounds so logical, like as if we knew that we were going to create a product line extension and we were going to use this feature to do it. It's a, we didn't know any of that. We just knew these Random facts that I just told you, those facts were not in any page that any one person knew at all. Those things that are brought together and said, oh, market thought of us this way, and we were saturating that this, that. those are just facts in the world of thousand other facts. And in this room, what we sort of knew was this new tech was coming out, what should we price it? And that was actually the conversation. No one ever said, let's come up with a strategic direction for the company. We said, what are we gonna price this new feature? And from pricing that new feature back and forth between sales, product, marketing, we just went, why don't we sell it as a module and we'll charge more for a module? That, that's the basic idea, right? We would keep iterating over saying, well, it'll be a separate module and we'll charge more for that module. But you know, I do the math and you say, okay, we'll sell it as a module and only 20% of people will buy it. And the, and the module price has to be lower than the price of your core platform, right? That's what a module means. So if you have something that is lower priced than your platform appreciably and only 20% of people buy it, how much revenue did you just recover? You didn't become a Lexus. You didn't change the game. So what could you do? So back and forth, there was no one person actually, you know, if I'm supposed to be the strategy guy, it sure as heck wasn't me that laid this out. I, I think about that moment a lot is how did we end up with what altered the life of our company? I have no idea. It just, it just did. We just kept talking and going back and forth. And somehow this end entity was created that I've actually never seen anywhere. I'll talk a little bit about that next, which is adaptability. We just had one feature. That's all we were going to get. You can't just like go tell the product team, hey, go make me like five more of these and boom, we'll have a product line. We have one feature. How in the world is that a product line? And, and this, this is the, the strange insight. How this can be an insight, I don't know, but it changed the company. We sold the new product line now at the cost of them paying the higher maintenance of a new product line, but with no license fee to buy it now, right? This is pre-SaaS software. So you had, let's say, a license fee of $50,000, and then you paid 20% of that license fee year after year. So what we said is, hey, this new product line, the advanced product line, it's not going to be $50,000. It's going to be $100,000. But 
And it's going to have all these other features. Next year, there'll be another important one. The year after, there'll be another important one. But today, there's only the one feature. So we understand that there's only one feature. And we understand we can't even tell you what feature two and feature three are. We just can tell you this is the advanced product line. But a concession we will make then is you're not paying 100K to, to switch over to this product line. You're actually paying no license fee. You're just going to start paying the maintenance of 100 which 20% of 100K is 20K. You were paying 10K maintenance. Now you're going to pay 20K maintenance, but you'll now be in the new product line. And those future stream of capabilities that will come to you, you will automatically inherit by being in the new product line. So this is how we turn saying one nice feature where the customer can feel it, taste it, and say, wow, I always wanted this. This is exactly what I told you I wanted. And you're giving it to me, and you're telling me you're going to give me more of these kind of things that I want if I move into this new product line. But that can only work, by the way, if you have these customers that themselves are becoming prosperous. So at the same time we're doing this, our customers are moving into the shales. The shales is going great for them. And each of them have an aspirational view of themselves now, not as an organization with 50, 100, 300 people, but as an organization that's going to challenge the exons of the future. So they immediately think, I've had a Toyota my whole life. I'm going to buy the Lexus. And suddenly that company that was selling a Toyota comes to them and says, I have the keys to the Lexus. I can't deliver it to you today, but you pay me the monthly payment. And when the Lexus is ready, I will deliver it to you. So that's how we were able to match outside trends of that what was changing about our customer and the internal function that we're creating into this, this ability to break out of the decision matrix. So what did we do? Do you have many customers? Yes, we did. So didn't, don't we have to do what the customer says to support revenue? Absolutely, we did what the customer said to support revenue, but we were Neo in this case. We dodged the bullets we were able to weave in between those requirements and out of that craft something that is strategically a massive transition to the company in that it moved us from selling just Toyotas to Toyotas and Lexuses. So what happened? The valuation of that company grew 250%, 57% in three years. We never grew volume. The number of units that we sold per year Stay the same. That's not a decline. We're, that still means we're gaining share, right? We're just not gaining share at a faster rate because we already have the share in that market space. So we never grew number of units sold per year, but our revenue doubled. And that's because 65% of these organizations chose to upgrade to our advanced product line. So we never did get to the higher mountain. We didn't sell the Shell or Exxon. We just turned our own customers into more premium customers uh, through these combination of factors. So with that, I'll leave you with this last point of the auto. So this guy, Badi Hooker Audi Benugi, uh, sorry, I don't speak Hindi, I speak Bangla, so I probably said this all wrong. But when I grow up, I want to become an Audi. So this guy wants to become an Audi. We became a Lexus. I thought it was pretty fitting. So that, that's my thinking on strategy. If we've got questions, I guess I'm happy to answer. Super. <clears throat> I think the audience is uh, so engrossed and mesmerized. Now they're going to start thinking about the questions. Uh, but meanwhile, I think, you know, there are a couple that, uh, you know, we could start with. Uh, so I think, you know, first of all, amazing um, pick or choice of analogies there, uh, Indy. I think the Matrix and the Auto, uh, both quite familiar uh, at the same time, the way that you have identified those key characteristics and overlaid on the tactics of it, right? How do you take these um, specific steps, navigate the road, know your roads, and, and take different routes to it uh, is fascinating, right? I think especially your case study kind of illustrated uh, what I think, and I've been in my career uh, in that dilemma for a long time, right? There are if, you, if your product has a lot of customers and some of them are very vocal, right? And you tend to naturally listen to these vocal customers because they're either constantly threatening to move away 
from you or bringing in some competition into the discussion and, and you still have the threat of moving away. So now how do you navigate through this thing that, you know, you don't want to spend uh, so much resources and efforts in building something that will only benefit a handful of people, uh, but at the same time, you're not probably listening to the silent majority, right? So I think, um, and that's something that everyone who has built products uh, will understand. And your example kind of showed a, a slightly different and interesting way how to deal with that. So one thing is, what do you think, um, you know, when companies grow, now the, this is in the context of what you said, best of uh, best line fit that you brought in, right? So you, you looked at that one particular feature that many customers were asking for, and then you focused on bringing that into this and probably that grew into a new product line. But what do you think makes big customers lose sight of such things that the customers have been asking for, right? And, and of course, that is the reason why smaller, nimbler companies come in, focus on that particular lead, and then they uh, you know, build a product that just satisfies that need and brilliantly so, right? So what makes the, the, the growing companies or even larger companies lose sight of such things? Yeah, I, I guess what I would say is, and you know, I, I've been run product teams as well as marketing or strategy, and I come up with this same problem every time, which is your existing customers have a flood of small feature requests that just inundate you every day. And every day, the top priority for that week is how to solve that small challenge. You know, all the time we have like, for oil and gas customers, being able to print out to a very large high performance printer is a critical thing because they have to print out this big geological map. All the time, we would just be like, oh, there's a new printer and we have to have a new, you know, compatibility and a new DLL to make that printer work. And that was a huge deal. But all we were ever solving is how to have compatibility with the latest printer. So how do you get out of that and actually build something that matters? That, that's what I think kills it. Like I said, customer kills it, their desire. Mm. Nice. Um, on the promised uh, future, uh, you know, you created a new product line with just one feature. And then, of course, you promised the future to them that this will evolve with new features. And you also mentioned that we are not going to tell you what those are, but we promise that those are something that you've been looking for or asking for, right? So as you add these features, and you also talked about how instead of paying any license fee, you ask them to look at the maintenance fee, right? Now, in a larger context, uh, you know, if I were honestly, if I were reading this in some article somewhere, I would be thinking that why would a customer agree when you change the price of this, when you increase the value of this product in the future, right? How would you make that work? Because a customer now is, um, you know, has understood and agreed to the price that you have initially offered them, only the maintenance fee with that interesting and important feature, but then you're going to add value to this product along the way. Um, I doubt if you're not going to change the pricing or monetization model of that. And if that happens, wouldn't that create a friction among among? So how would you help the customer or your organization maneuver that? Like Neo. Yeah. Um, in, in terms of how do you help help the organization? Say, say that again. Meaning, how do you get them to adopt the new model? Yeah. So let's say that your customer has already adopted this new product line, new product that you offered them. And, 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 and it's very happy that I don't have to pay license fee, fee, but only the maintenance fee, right? But you also promised future that there will need new capabilities that will get added to that. And at that point, would the, I mean, the natural thinking or strategy is to, because there is now the product has more value, you're going to capture that value, uh, you know, with additional pricing, right? Or, or a new monetization model. But that would cause, especially when you have existing customers, you could do that for new customers. But what would you do for the existing customers? Yeah, for the existing, our whole point was predicated on saying, <clears throat> we're not charging more for those future products. We're getting the money up front for them to be on that product line. So new customers, we were charging more. But for the existing guys, we were only doing it off of what is effectively doubling the maintenance. So, okay. Mm. Think about underlying what that change is. If you're paying 10K maintenance and now you're paying 20K maintenance and you could get 65% of your customers to switch and for a mature company, 70% of their revenue is maintenance. 
So if you doubled 70% of your revenue, then you almost doubled the revenue of your company. Right. Now, so, you, so you're now running the software or SaaS company, Aveta. Uh, the notion of this maintenance, at least uh, in the SaaS, is, is not there, right? So, so there must be another strategy that, or another way that you'll have to come up with, um, you know, possibly add-ons or some other mechanism to do something. Right. Yeah, and so we've, we've got a different strategy now. We, we do one kind of service around safety, and we're saying, you know, why not take those suppliers? And if we're already serving them for safety compliance, do sustainability compliance at the mm-hmm. same time, which for us, very low cost to be able to deliver that, but uh, a completely new product. Yeah. So there are a few quick questions. Uh, Bala Subramanian asks, um, you brought in the analogy of we are the Toyota, and we are giving the keys to the Lexus, promising that you pay as monthly, uh, you know, premium or, or, or maintenance, and then you get that. Now, this, of course, requires change in perception from the customer's point of view on, on, on you not being a Toyota anymore, but you being a Lexus. So how would that, perce- you know, how would the customers perceive um, when you are trying to present yourself as a, as a different brand, because they're used to working with you, dealing with you as a, as a certain organization or with a certain type of product. And, and then, so now you're suddenly shifting that perception. And that's a yeah. challenge. It's a great point. So I, I will say this, which is one of my core concepts is uh, you, that is a saying, uh, at least in the US, that you sell more Bibles to the converted, hmm. meaning if you're a Bible salesman, don't go find places where there are not Christians. Go to a Christian home and they will buy a second Bible more likely than you're going to convert someone to buy one. Mm. So, which is to say your brand position is what you have to go embrace. I didn't change brand position. If you change brand position, forget about it. Nobody changes brand position. Mm. Go run straight into your brand position. It's just, that was my point of the matrix guy, Neo dodging the bullet. You're going to just slightly take what they said and pivot that back around to your advantage, which is we're the cheap, low cost provider. One way to talk about a low cost provider is that you're kind of the crappy thing that no one wants because you're cheap. That's one brand position pivot. The other brand position pivot is to say you're the Lexus, you're low cost, you're durable, you're dependable, you're the one that can get it done at a fraction of the cost. And so we heard a customer say, you're the Lexus. And so when I heard that statement, I was like, that's it. Mm-hmm. We already have a mind share in our, the minds of our customers that we just, that we just pivot them slightly to say, we are the Lexus. And that required things like increasing price and saying, we're suddenly going to have much more advanced features and, and changing our customer our appearance to customers all created that notion that we're going to become a Lexus, but we did move toward the direction that they thought already. Okay, interesting. Um, so, you know, while the, the, the case study that you gave was interesting, uh, you know, we can't all rely on some amazing insights. Suddenly one woke up in the morning and say, hey, why not we just create a new product line? So uh, are there any, I think this is again a question from the audience. Uh, are there any proven methodologies or frameworks that one can apply uh, in a certain situation to, to explore various ways of getting into this? Definitely not. Definitely not. Blue Ocean Strategy, uh, Ansoft Matrix, all that stuff. I, I don't know them very well. I kind of read them. I read some business literature. I used to when I started my career. It's fine. Uh, it definitely helps kind of know the landscape, but just be operational. Mm-hmm. Know the details of the finances of your business know which customer deals are happening, why your sales rep cares about those deals, be able to demo your product, know the features that are happening in your product. Just know your product, know it technically hard and cold, know your finances, know your uh, sales. Don't ever think about strategy. Just know the thing that you do as a business and the strategy will emerge out of that. On the other hand, if you know about the frameworks and the concepts, you're never going to get there because you can't build off that and no one's going to listen to you and no one's going to, you don't have any resources for your strategy guy. 
So you just need to solve the problems that are small and tactical in your own business and move that towards a strategic endeavor. Good. So uh, hopefully Chaitali and Bala, you know, your questions to Blue Ocean Strategy and Ansoff got answered uh, without us bringing it up. Yeah, um, I'm gonna say, I, I barely know what those things are. I know Blue Ocean was something for a while and I kind of looked at it once and I forget what it is. Ansoff, I just looked it up on Wikipedia. It's like large existing products versus, I don't know, something. Those yeah. are all fine. I, it's not that they're wrong, but yeah. I just, I don't know how you're going to get to an answer for that. Okay. I can't. Now, so, I mean, what you're saying is it's good to know them, but they may not give you insights or, or, or pointers on your current situation or your special context. So exactly. the only way to know that is you know your product well, customers well, finances well, operations well, and then, uh, you know, collaborate with the team on some insight, some idea, and come up with uh, such a solution is what you're saying. Okay. Yeah, I mean, there, there's no level of technical depth that I think is inappropriate for a business leader to be aware of. Uh, that's a, at least in the US, it's a huge misconception that uh, somehow being technical and being in the weeds and knowing about speeds and feeds and performance details means that you don't understand the big picture. There's no such thing as a big picture. There's only knowing the specific details. And from that, like if you look at Elon Musk, you think he doesn't know the details about rockets, about uh, electric batteries, he knows all the details. Well, he, he's famous to have, uh, you know, to spend uh, uh, months together on you know, devouring anything and everything that you can get on another topic, right? So right. knowing that stuff uh, helps a lot. So uh, one more question. I think, you know, how are startups different in, in, in this uh, approach? Uh, is there any different way to think about how this applies to startups, especially, um, you know, when... And startups are running at high risk. You're threatened from, you know, various things. And in order to change or, you know, come up with a new strategic plan, if something isn't working, is that the same approach that you would suggest? Or uh, are there other factors that influence uh, the smaller companies? If you will? Yeah, it's a great point. And I've worked at very, very young startups before and looked at the same issue. And, and the, the, by the way, sorry, this, this question comes. I just want to acknowledge the folks who are asking this. Ragini and Vijayananda are the other folks that are asking that. Yeah. I do think it's primarily similar and often the word used in the case of the startup is the pivot, which I, I would say that you have to be flexible enough to realize that what you do as a startup is unlikely to be the thing that you will be successful at. And so that means talking to those customers and being able to shift yourself towards some other use case that wasn't the primary use case that you were built for. Hmm. Okay, super. I think, uh, you know, I, I tried to bring in multiple questions that have been asked into um, one so that you can, you know, address that uh, for all the audience. Again, thank you so much, guys, for uh, your questions. Uh, you know, thank you, Indy. Absolutely. I think the best question today uh, really goes to, you know, uh, Vijayananda, who has asked uh, the question that you just answered. Um, and uh, just want to quickly take a minute to talk about uh, what we have here. It's called a leaderboard. So, Shama, if you can show the leaderboard. Um, a leaderboard is essentially, you know, all of you folks can actually refer your friends to join these conferences and get onto this leaderboard with points and win some amazing uh, stuff here, right? So uh, incredible digital learning or uh, other things that are giveaway. So all you need to do is um, go to the web page, which is linked from there, um, so, you, know, you know, get onto the leaderboard and then invite your friends. It takes about 30 seconds. Okay, thank you. And um, before, before we get onto that, I'd really appreciate indeed your time. Um, I know, uh, it's it's uh, it started early morning um, in the U.S., but uh, truly appreciate you uh, coming in here. So what I'd like to do is uh, this is yet to be NFT uh, approved <laughs> uh, as a token of uh, appreciation. Please accept the digital certificate on behalf of IPL. Uh, we are working on getting the NFT uh, stuff for this, and then uh, you know hopefully there is proof. 
that uh, this of ownership to you, right? And thank you so much. Truly appreciate you um, coming over and sharing your insights.